Welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcast, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Laura Noland, and on behalf of everyone here at JSA, thank you for tuning in to our JSA Virtual Roundtable, Edge Data Centers, Critical Low Latency Solutions for Big Cities. We do have a couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. Our first 100 registrants for today's roundtable have now received lunch delivered to your door or a gift card, so please enjoy. We do have nearly 400 registrations for today's roundtable, so if you weren't one of our first, hopefully next time. Make sure you register early for our monthly roundtables at jsa.net. We want to hear from you and make this roundtable experience as interactive as possible for you, so please add any questions that you might have into the chat or request the mic to come on camera and ask your questions directly to our panelists. Also, stick around because once our virtual roundtable is over, you can join virtual networking tables immediately following for a unique opportunity to talk face-to-face -face with other event attendees and speakers. Simply join a table in the lounge area and let the networking begin. Okay, so let's get started. Our topic today, again, is edge data centers, critical low latency solutions for big cities. To introduce our speakers and to moderate, please welcome Fedor Smith, President and Managing Partner at Atlantic ACM. Fedor, thank you for joining us today and the floor is yours. Thanks, Laura, and thank you to JSA for putting this all together. Obviously a topic of great interest based on the, uh, the registrations and attendance. Very excited to have a, not just a great list of panelists, but a great range of, of uh, you know, entities within the industry represented. So we'll, we'll get right to it. I'm actually gonna ask the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, so if each of you can run through, give a quick introduction of who you are and a, a very light background on the role your company plays in the industry. Uh, let's start there and then we'll jump into questions. Starting out with Todd, please. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Todd Cushing and I'm uh, based in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm the president of 1623 Farnham. 1623 Farnham is a right in the middle of the of the United States. It is a edge data center that uh, hosts uh, hyperscale connectivity. We've seen a lot of growth through content and um, the ecosystem has just developed a lot over the last couple of years. So that's really what we're seeing is important for us is to grow connectivity and the uh, interconnection. Excellent. Doug, you want to jump in there? Sure. I'm Doug Recker. I'm the founder and president of Edge Presence. We deploy micro data centers in tier two to tier four markets, bringing better connectivity into the community and providing co-location where there currently isn't any. Excellent. Mark? Hi, folks. Thanks for um, having me. Uh, thanks to JSA. Uh, I'm Mark Teeley. I'm a CEO and founder for Edgevana. Um, I have a long-time uh, IT career. I uh, love to participate. Uh, I've been on um, uh, in groups like uh, IBM Cloud Minds, uh, IDCA uh, chair for their technical committee, uh, um, founded Data Center Pulse uh, with my brother-in-law back in 2008, um, things like that. I um, more, more recently have gotten out of um, building infrastructure for others and have started my own firm uh, uh, called Edgevana. And at Edgevana, we're attempting to help enterprises and technology companies uh, more effectively leverage global resources of networking um, and services and specifically data center. Uh, through effectively speeding their adoption and allowing them more flexibility of choice globally. So that's where Edgevana plays in this market. Excellent. Yeah. Jason? Hey, good afternoon. I'm Jason Borg. I'm the Vice President of Revenue and Strategy for Edge Micro. We uh, build micro data centers uh, for the co-location market in uh, underserved and uh, large metropolitan areas. Uh, as well as uh, dedicated solutions for our, our core anchor tenants. Excellent, Christina. Hope oh, you're muted. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Christina Witt here. Uh, thank you, JSA, for the opportunity of this roundtable. Um, I'm a director with Solutions Architecting for Edge Connects. Um, we have been building data centers for um, over a decade through the edge, and I've been in the data center industry for 
I would say, um, close to two decades now. So I'm just happy to be here uh, today. Thank you. And last but not least, Hugh. All right. Well, uh, hello. This is uh, and good afternoon. This is Hugh Cars back. And uh, Fedor, unfortunately, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I can hear everybody else. So if someone else, if I get a direct question, just repeat his question, and then I'll be able to answer. Um, JSA, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Hugh Karspeck and Chief Strategy and Co-Founder of Dart Points. Um, Dart Points owns and manages edge data centers, uh, focusing on the smaller tier twos, the tier threes, and the, uh, the what we call the tier four markets uh, that are underserved with respect to high quality interconnection, peering, colo, and cloud services. Excellent. Thank you all very much, and thanks again for being here. Um, we'll start very high level, and I want this to be an open discussion, so I'll put out questions and, and please contribute as relevant, and I'll obviously call some of you out on very specific things. Starting with the generalities, uh, this is a very young technology. It's still very early days, but the vision of Edge and the buzzwords associated with it have always been 5G, IoT, AR, VR, autonomous vehicles, obviously a lot of things that are still in development themselves. With the now growing actual deployments out there, where are you seeing these facilities being utilized both in terms of number of deployments and amount of capacity um, in terms of who's using them and how? Hey, oh, Aaron, go ahead. I think for us it's been, medical has been taking advantage of AR you know, augmented reality, virtual reality. Uh, there's been a surprising amount of content that's needed to be moved on their campuses as they develop it and with partners. And then amongst other, from one ecosystem to another. So we, we find that the medical community is really taking advantage of it in a way that surprises. us. And, and this is Mark uh, for Edgevana. The, we've seen um, uh, a interest in on the medical side as well. Um, I think what, uh, you know, the assumption for most people when they think about edge deployments is they're thinking it's going to be like something that will show up like a TV on every corner, then they'll recognize it and they'll know what's being delivered. But edge is actually being delivered um, in thousands of different ways already. Uh, and most of it is invisible, largely invisible to um, uh, the average layman or casual observer from uh, factory floor edge, sometimes using private uh, um, 5G to logistics oriented solutions um, uh, to better traffic management, uh, smart buildings, smart homes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're seeing things even even like um, putting security out near the edge for folks that are using uh, remote applications, um, oftentimes, uh, resolving security at the edge offers a um, significant improvement in overall performance of their experience uh, because uh, otherwise all of the transactions with security have to go back and forth to some remote cloud location. When you, are these all, you mentioned medical, you mentioned security, are these all individual enterprise customers utilizing edge deployments or is it the security vendors themselves and how much have the carriers or operators or software vendors been in play versus individual enterprise entities utilizing the facilities because of uh, immediacy and adjacency? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had conversations with a few operators to answer that question first, but there hasn't been um, a lot of uptake from the operators uh, that I've seen, or at least not requests. It seems like the operators in most cases are waiting for someone to, to give them the workload and then they'll consider investing to support that workload. Uh, and, and maybe that's the right approach, um, but I think they're potentially likely to miss the opportunity if they continue to focus on it that way. Um, we're seeing a mix as far as people that are actually requesting from, from technology-oriented providers that are creating a service to folks that are building their own service and deploying. In the case specifically of the security solution, it was a company that was um, creating uh, security for uh, remote control and remote access to highly secure control systems, like a chemical facility or a dam or something like that, where a combination of both latency, security, and um, geographic uh, sovereignty were important to the solution. I think for, for us, it's been, we're, we're neutral on carrier neutral or interconnection facility. 
So we have found that there may be 5G on a, on a campus from multiple providers. Omaha was early, early on uh, 5G city. And so multiple carriers uh, providing a solution to a large facility uh, on, on campus and then dark fiber being used to move large files that would be you know, 3D to holographic, um, you know, body parts or hands, parts, organs, whatever. Could be uh, could be moved with that with that technology, and so they're they're sharing that data amongst regions. And Christina, you guys were started out in a sort of carrier content oriented focus. Has that continued to grow, and and how has that influenced your role? Yes, exactly. So I mean, um, at Edge Connect, we have been building data centers for you know over a decade. Um, we first started building edge facilities for content, but we, of course, the introduction with the cloud, we have seen obviously that both contenders, the cloud and obviously um, content are driving our demand as well. Um, so we're seeing both from, from, from the cloud side of the house and also for different reasons, obviously, they both want the cloud, you know, they both want the uh, edge but however, they have a different need for those, um, obviously for, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, for the, you know, for the cloud providers, they're looking more from the business aspect for the edge, whereas uh, your content provider, they're looking more for, you know, for delivery basis. Yeah, that makes sense. And and, and for, du for Doug and Jason, you guys are obviously, you know, deploying in a variety of locations. Who's driving your deployment decisions? Early on, it was availability. Uh, you know, now I assume it's more demand-driven. And what's what's? Well, I'll just jump in real quick. From from what we've deployed already, what and you know, our markets are different. So tier two to tier four, the threes are really our sweet spot. You know, um, we're not seeing five G play yet. We're not. Those aren't our customers. Our customers basically, when you go into like a Statesboro or one of our <clears throat> facilities, we drop there. The connectivity is an issue in that town. So you have ma one major carrier and that's it. So when we come in, we bring our pod, we tie back to the closest carrier hotel and we bring all those carriers to that market, right? So now they can co-locate right there. They can buy cheap bandwidth, poor bandwidth and have better connecti connectivity and peering. So that's the option we're bringing in. We're building that infrastructure out. So when 5G does come into that market, that we're, we're already there. They can plug right into us and the, and the network is there. But we're seeing enterprise driving it, like the hospitals, the local governments, the education, where they can get a backup or they can get their main production through there. That's, that's what we're seeing. Yeah, I'd say we're, you know, early on our core anchor tenant for the uh, content providers and cloud providers uh, and still are driving a, a lot of our business. And from a cloud perspective, it was, you know, a combination of, you know, portions of their cloud stack uh, that were latency sensitive, as well as some test dev uh, to throw out there to see, you know, what kind of uh, requirements and, and analytics they could get off of those stacks. Uh, the content providers uh, obviously pushing content out closer to the edge. And we're seeing some enterprise and some medical, but not directly, you know, through our integration partners. Uh, those guys are the ones also uh, providing the 5G uh, services and platforms for their end user customers. So we're getting a lot of traction through our integration partners who are coming in and providing hybrid solutions to end user clients, private cloud, public cloud, dedicated cloud like uh, Azure or Outpost, as well as private 5G and then, you know, on into, uh, you know, analytics and IoT that they're providing as a service. This is Hugh, I'll jump in a little bit. I'm, I, I'm not, unable to hear any of Fader's comments and questions, so my apologies, guys. So, um, uh, dark points on, the, on, on our front with regards to the types of customers, we've been really focusing a lot on what we call kind of the ecosystem, the customer ecosystem. So you have enterprises, you have cellular carriers, you've got fiber carriers, you've got content providers, you've got cloud providers. Um, all of which come in and consume these resources at different times for different reasons. Um, and it, 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 it's quite a rich environment, um, uh, but in terms of, you'll see certain s sections of the industries come in earlier than others. Um, and then those that are coming later are coming in because of those that are currently in that environment. So it's, it's kind of that, that diagram that 
that we always see about the fishy, small fish being eaten by larger fish and so on and so forth. We're seeing that very much alive uh, in these sites. That makes good sense. And, and, and Hugh can't hear me, but my follow-on question would be, obviously, you guys ha have a combination of uh, partner and integration enabler, but also you own facilities now and a, a large number of facilities. Um, how is that, and I, this goes to everybody, how is that relationship of enabler versus owner versus partner evolved in the market? Obviously, no one's going to be able to service this market uh, across the board. Mark, your whole model is predicated on enabling connections. Yeah, no, absolutely, Fedor. Um, it's 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 interesting that, uh, and this is probably being seen by most everybody on the panel, but um, more and more the customers looking for um, solution set, right? And it sounds so obvious. I feel stupid even saying it, um, uh, because in IT we were taught from you know uh, uh, when we were in diapers to not offer a technology, offer a solution. But um, when you when it comes to global provisioning of infrastructure. Um, uh, most companies are still providing a piece of what makes up a very large complex solution, whether it's the type of hardware you pick, um, the strategy for redundancy and resiliency in that hardware, what the application design requires, what kind of network performance is required, whether or not data sovereignty will play into it, uh, what kind of compliance or um, local government ability to pay taxes apply, uh, to what type of data center is needed, uh, what the growth prospects are, all of those things individually for any one of us historically in the data center space or in the network space seem like discrete requests. But when you put the solution together, you see that for the average IT or owner, the average head of infrastructure, head of applications, whoever is responsible for building this, it's 17 projects before the first rack shows up on somebody's data center. And so helping to solve for that, uh, especially today, uh, I think is critical for all of us, but it's a, it's sort of a foundational notion for what we're doing at Edgevana. That, that, that makes sense. And that actually begs the question. This goes out to obviously, Christina, your model is enabling people who deliver a service. How much of this is going to end up being a sort of tower model where the edge data centers are all different vendors who enable a variety of operators to deliver a service, not necessarily obviously the, the carriers, but um, software operators, et cetera, versus direct interaction with end user. And how is that playing out so far? I know, Doug, you have a number of direct end user relationships, but is it evolving towards a more um, third party relationship versus first party? Uh, I would say it's mostly third party. That's, I mean, it used to be a direct, you know, um, customer relationship, but we're seeing more of a third party type of, you know, relationships evolving um, through the various ecosystems that we're seeing in the industry. So I would say mostly third parties. Yeah, I would say that it's more of a mix with us because the bigger enterprise, we deal directly with them. Like I said before, like the hospitals, the state, county type of customer. But yeah, but most of our most of our, what do you call leads or people that are interested are, are coming through an integrator or a managed services provider. I say, you know, from, from our business, you talked about the partnership piece and, and the evolution, but you know, we, we've got end user clients that don't want to manage infrastructure at the edge, but want to be in multiple locations. So our core has always been to kind of focus on the CDNs and the cloud providers. So we're able to refer um, at times customers that want to buy VMs at the edge to one of our clients that's already buying space from us to allow them to deploy. Obviously, we'd love to get those guys to actually deploy physical infrastructure. There's another paying customer that wants to deploy in multiple markets, but they don't want to manage their own physical assets. Um, and then obviously I talked about the integrators. We're getting, that's that's really our key into the enterprise market uh, because we're a smaller company and we don't have a hundred sales reps. That's, you know, others are shaking their heads because they're, they're in the same boat, right? It's a way to increase oh, yeah. your feet on the street, right? I mean, yeah. uh, and, and, and getting, get, making things simple. So making things a simple line item for integrators to be able to sell. It's co-location. It's been around for years. You know, we didn't uh, you know, reinvent the wheel with, with our offering. It's very simple. It's very easy to sell. Uh, you know, when you start talking about use cases and you start uh, trying to manage more than, uh, you know, your box, uh, that's when things get complicated. We try to keep things simple and it's, it's resonated pretty well uh, with our partnerships as well as our end users. 
and if you're operating across multiple platforms and integrators, et cetera, then obviously they're, they're going to be interacting with one another. I know, Jason, you guys have put a lot of focus on locating your data centers and network hubbing or relatively high network presence spots. And obviously, Todd, your interconnection is a major part of your business. How significant is that in the request you receive for Edge? Is it usually one site, one connect, connect point of connectivity, or is usually the interconnection with third-party networks or multiple network access a very relevant part? I think for us initially, uh, because we were focused on the big guys, you know, they have uh, you know agreements with global providers, and you know we just decided to connect them directly to those providers and not get in the way. And we partner with you know folks like the co-location providers, you know, uh, folks like Todd, folks like people that have good interconnection, uh, you know, uh, stints in, in different markets that we can tether to, uh, so that, you know, we're not, we're not really trying to run an interconnect business. We want an ecosystem built, but until the carriers localize traffic in, in the markets that we're going to, you know, creating a, an interconnect model is just going to be a hub and spoke, which we're happy to do and tether to, but our clients really drive our connectivity model. I, I can chime in a little bit on that. Um, we're seeing something a little bit different on our end. Um, we, uh, we just announced uh, maybe about a month ago, two months ago, um, our own IX that we're placing into our markets. Um, uh, it's what we call our bridge IX. Um, and that is, uh, is, in, is enabling local peering out at these locations, uh, which is uh, really allowing the carriers to come in and regardless of what contracts they may or may not have, whether they tether or backhaul back to other locations, which is always a part of the mixture, um, that ability to get that content and that carrier peering at these uh, remote locations directly in that space has been a, a huge positive. So I think for, for us being a single site, we're surrounded by hyperscale. So people come there that are on-ramp partners or that want access to the hyperscale. They can't be in their facilities, so they'll their but their internets are in our their their networks are in our facility. So they they come to us to get direct access to those uh, those hyperscale folks, and they want access to the internet exchange or ways to peer data to put content out there. So it's again it's latency. To those hyperscale, it's the it's the access to their networks, and then uh, the ability to peer is what drives it to our single facility. That makes sense. And one of the questions that's coming in, I think, is relevant because of the range of, of folks we have here is uh, how how are we defining edge versus traditional data center? Obviously, you know, Christina, you guys are were the first edge play, but by contemporary standards, are you know, hyperscale for my intensive burden in a lot of your locations. So um, how, how are people differentiating between the two and how much of it is site specific to the client? How much of it is providing a latency solution in an urban market? And how much of it is providing, as Doug mentioned, sort of access in tier three places where there's a complete absence of alternatives? Right. So right now we're um, with the cloud. Um, we're seeing a lot of our clients, you know, drive um, basically our locations where we need to go, where we are, you know, having these facilities where they are single tenants, uh, basically for, you know, for the hyperscales that we build, uh, build to suit facilities. Um, we're, you know, if you have to compare it to more of the traditional colo, where you have a multi-tenant facility, where most of those clients in that multi-tenant facility are going to be more of an enterprise. We're seeing more of a wholesale market um, now that we're, you know, have a big focus uh, on the hyperscale. How would others define the differentiation between edge and, and how it differs from traditional data center? Obviously, it's in a lot of places the same service for all intents and purposes. Is it sure. size, location, form factor? Yeah, I think for us, uh, you know, it started out and it's still a core part of our business to build out in you know, underserved and underdeveloped markets where Colo doesn't exist. But, you know, we've got clients that, you know, that Christina mentioned, you know, uh, build the suit. I mean, we've got we've got a few of those engagements going on right now, where we're building custom footprints for for uh, a few clients, where it, it's not really in an, an edgy type market. Um, it could be just outside of a major me major metro, but our customers want to take back control over their deployments uh, versus going into a traditional bricks and mortar building uh, with an old you know cola provider that 
can only do 150 or 200 watts a square foot. So, you know, we, we kind of coined the edge anywhere phase because we don't really define at edge micro, we don't define what is edge. It's really where our clients want to deploy. Um, and, and I'd say it's, it's modular versus, you know, traditional, you know, tilt wall, uh, you know, uh, bricks and mortar type construction for, in our case. Yeah, speaking for, um, for Edgevana or, you know, maybe just my experience, not, not really Edgevana, um, is that um, really an edge data center to um, uh, what was just explained is wherever the opportunity um, uh, fits what's available. Right. Um, or you have to build for uh, one of the one of the key opportunities for existing infrastructure that, you know, most people building edge solutions or who already have edge oriented um, data center facilities in tier two, three and four markets is that the biggest advantage they have is not the design of their data center. It's not how big they are, or how small they are, although those are all important, including the density per square foot and the number of carriers and the peering. All of those things are important. But the single most important thing is the fact that they are already there. And if you're looking at, at somebody like an Amazon or a Google or a Microsoft or even a Cloudflare, uh, anybody in, in those types of categories of, um, of the need for getting to the edge or deploying application support systems out to the edge, um, is that whether they're building a 100 megawatt campus or building a five megawatt facility on the edge of Fremont, California, the due diligence involved in getting to the point where they bulldoze the first blade of grass is largely the same. So economically speaking for the large cloud providers, it makes no sense for them to say it, spend on 10, 15, 20,000 eventual locations at the edge, the same per location in due diligence, what they would spend in developing a hundred megawatt campus. And that's where the edge players really have an advantage and folks who already have built uh, in a location, even if that location has to be augmented to support future work, that's where the advantage lies. Yeah, I absolutely support Mark what you just said because that is the name. I mean, first of all, the Edge has been around 40 years, 50 years. I cut my teeth on a lot of the uh, access technologies um, that have kind of driven a lot of that. It is exactly that. It is when people try to differentiate whether something's centralized or, or core or Edge or what have you, it's really kind of a moot point. It is exactly and a little bit of Jason's point, when a customer wants to be in a location, if there's nothing there, their mindset is very different. If something is there, then it's, oh, you're there. Let me go take a look at it. And so some of these uh, can be facilities um, that that they are, you don't want to undercut any of these facilities that are out there. But the point being is, is it's a very different dialogue because right now when we talk to customers that are doing these massive network designs and things, they're all doing it with an ancient perspective in mind in a lot of ways. A lot of the hub and, and spoking and a lot of it going back to the core. However, what they're trying to do is create a brand new set of data that is highly localized, mm. um, uh, highly rich. Uh, we see less of a latency model and more of a, a, of a new revenue model that they're trying to access. Um, but they can't do that unless they can. There's something that will allow them and enable them to do that. And I think Hugh, I 100% I agree with what you're saying. I think what we're, we're hearing from our clients is that data has gravity, so it's latency and it's only going to go so far and it's going to hit the ground. So they're they're deploying different applications, new ways to communicate, new structures, but the gravity is what forces them to the edge and have to look for solutions. Mm -hmm. And, and just real quick, back to Jason's point, what we're seeing in the micro data center business and going into these markets is we're, we're getting some very interesting calls and, and designs that that companies want to they want to compute on site. These big manufacturing facilities, like you know, one of the largest grocery chain, is looking at putting one at every location just for their AI and for inventory management. And it doesn't make sense to go all the way back to the main hub. So they feed what they want back. So they're not, they don't need this robust connectivity at all these grocery stores. And it's, it's fascinating what they're doing. So when you look at the edge, you know, where, where do you stop it? Where do you say the, you know, what is truly the edge to us? The edge is where the, like everybody says, where the, where the data is. Right. And that's why we go into these markets, these tier three and tier four markets, because that to us is where the data is, but there's nothing to help them compute there. There's there's no choices. So that's that's our market, and that's why we're bidding out to those those tier three and tier fours. But it, it's fascinating to, to go into Atlanta and 
and hear that they need 36 of these micro data centers throughout their grocery chain just in Atlanta. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see how all this compute goes. I, I had a meeting this morning just um, with, with a company that wants to deploy them throughout their facilities just for eye recognition and all the data that they're, they're collecting. You know, 13,000 people come through every day at each location and they want to capture that data. They want to keep it on site, but they want to backhaul it as well. So it's extremely interesting on how all this, you know, computer, you know, these autonomous vehicles are using in these warehouses and, and now they're delivering pizzas and all this kind of stuff. So it's really interesting to see if, where this is going to go. I'm, yeah. I'm loving that piece. Yeah, I mean, if I could add a little bit to what Doug said, I mean, uh, I agree with the points everyone's made and, and just kind of to, to add a, a, some additional weight. Um, as, a, as a longtime IT practitioner, um, one of the things I hated the most was the pragmatic decision, right? The pragmatic choice. And IT historically has always been about making pragmatic choices because either the technology wasn't ready or the cost to adopt the technology that could solve your problem was too high. Whether that was extra bandwidth, whether it was a data center in a remote location, uh, whether it was the right type of hardware, et cetera, et cetera. And today, logically speaking, there has never been a better set of selections with easier adoption models, including even new chipsets, in order for IT builders, technology builders, to build the best fit solution. And yet, when the average buyer looks to the market today, I, I'm, I'm certain, and I'm not gonna mention any large company names, but I'm certain almost everyone in this panel has experienced this at some level, is that when you talk to somebody about deploying, they say, well, you know, I looked at the market and I decided to go all with this one company because they have the most data centers. Hmm. And it's too hard to go with multiple data center providers. And yet, if everyone is using one data center provider, which in truth, even, even the largest actually only have about 80 unique locations, regardless of number of data centers. Just think about what um, Doug was just saying as compared to 80 data centers globally, how many just uh, Atlanta or Georgia needs, um, uh, what uh, the Autonomy Institute is looking to do in Texas might require as many as 1,500 little data center locations across just the city of Austin, right? So when you think about the pragmatic decision people are saying to be, I'm going to put my edge solution where every other player in the entire market has put their edge solution because pragmatically, that's the easiest thing for me to do to get something deployed, yeah. right? And so it's important for us as an industry to try to help facilitate how customers can absorb the infrastructure we build, not because um, you know, we have a better logo or a bigger footprint, but because we can apply what we do to solve problems most effectively for the customer. Yeah, that, sorry to interrupt. No. That makes perfect sense. And, and if that is the end game, if, if it is gonna be very specified in, ca in case specific deployments, and the, the go-to, you know, edge data center is basically what you know. You know, Doug, Doug has out there, and Jason's out there. People think about a shipping container size entity. Are we going to go from micro to nano to pico, and is this going to be a, a drop, a box dropped at each location? And then, you know, the role of an edge connects or or, or Farnham is to just, you know, hook them all together. Is mm -hmm. is that sort of what where it's all headed? It, it it could be, but you know, this is a whole nother apple we're going to deal with, right? Because the, these facilities that we build currently aren't cheap, right? And you have to have the revenue to support dropping one of these. So I think you're going to see a whole different evolution of different of micro data centers as well. I mean, you know, dropping a half a million dollar box behind a grocery store and they take five cabinets isn't going to isn't going to work. But yet they want the redundancies and they want all, all you know what a brick and mortar has to offer. So I think people are realizing you're not you're not going to get that. But you're going to get close, but I think the evolution of the micro data center is going to change a lot too, which it, it has to. I mean, it, it it has to. There's going to be some give and take here. Yeah, there's no doubt that the edge data center is going to go up the stack. There's no doubt. And and towards your point, you know, deploying these things is not simple in the form they are now. Um, what have been the biggest deployment issues for bringing this edge to reality? Um, and how is that, how do you think, do you think there's a reasonable solution for that going forward or, or what has to happen to make it more efficient to get these facilities in place? 
Um, here at Edge Connects, one of our, you know, most uh, challenges that we had, obviously, is as we go into the tier two and tier three markets, um, just to get a lot closer um, to, to, you know, to the customers. Um, it's been mostly, um, you know, there's, there's always, somebody mentioned, I think, the cost of these facilities. It is not cheap to build these facilities, but plus, if you go abroad, where we're seeing a tremendous amount of explosion um, at Edge Connect. We're seeing a, a tremendous amount of explosion in the Latin American markets and the Western European markets. We're seeing a lot of that. Um, it's dealing with, you know, the local permitting um, that delays. And with COVID, there's been a whole set of challenges dealing with that. Um, so for us, from our perspective, we're seeing a cost, but also the, you know, dealing with, you um, with the permitting, um, with the crews on site, and so forth. So, I think with the facilities, there's a lot of money. There's the infrastructure is what used to chase. Used to chase the multiple power feeds or the facility things or the the good or the bad. And now you're chasing the ecosystem. You're chasing the fiber. You're chasing the connectivity. You're chasing latency. You're chasing where your customers at. And, and stitching that together. And there's a lot of ways to do that. And, and that's what we'll talk about. But I think that you're either gonna build the ecosystem or you're gonna try to go where it's at or near it. We've seen an increase in the deployment size. So, you know, if in the beginning, uh, when we deployed out our markets, 8KW per rack, you know, socializing through our, you know, our, our core anchor tenant base who were driving us to these locations, you know, it was fine. Uh, and, and it still is for, you know, a lot that we're talking to, but after COVID's come out, we've seen kind of that, that demand go up, uh, as much as 22 KW Iraq. Um, and I think it kind of goes back to, well, you know, I do have, you know, these five or six locations that I need additional capacity. You know, I've got to buy five times the amount of square footage to deploy that type of environment um, with my, with a traditional provider, maybe I want to take back over some control. Um, and, and we're even seeing it to bear, it's a long-term, you know, uh, MSA with our client base and they're treating it as an owned asset uh, through their, you know, their organization, um, almost like they're, because it's a dedicated build, even though we're doing it in a, in a, uh, in a co-location MRC, you know, type uh, engagement, over seven or eight years, you know, they're looking at it and treating it as an owned facility under their umbrella because they do have a lot of control over, you know, how the stacks are deployed and what they do and and, and what they want. And Doug's shaking his head. He's probably seeing a lot of the same things. I, I think all of us are are seeing probably the same use cases, but we're focused on, you know, a couple of different ones. So I think that that's what it takes for the ecosystem is we're all going to be uh, in multiple markets. Um, I don't think it's going to be like, you know, it was in the old days where, you know, one edge provider moves into market X and no other edge provider goes there. I think we're all going to be in a lot of the same markets and, yeah. you know, probably work together um, on a lot of things like we do with the Colos today uh, and, and other partners. So it's going to be a fun, it's, it's been a fun ride so far. I think COVID slowed, you know, yeah. uh, some of these deployments down, but it's been, it's been interesting to see the change. Yeah. COVID has changed the dynamic. Peter, we do have another uh, hand raised to join our discussion. Uh, Matthew Haynes from KDDI America. Let's put him on. Hi, thanks. Thanks for uh, putting me on. I just uh, I have a go to market question uh, for you guys. So, is the is the go to, what percentage of the go to market is uh, sales outreach, and what percentage is fulfillment from um, enterprise customers that want access to the edge market that you built uh, the infrastructure in? I, I'll jump in first, real quick. I mean, we, we, we I'd say for us, uh, and, and I think Doug had mentioned it earlier. You know, when you've got a multi-tenant facility with, say, eight to ten racks of capacity, you know, we want to fill a certain number of those. Maybe it's three, maybe it's four um, to go into a market. And then the next, you know, four to five to six racks are all outreach to fill, um, you know, with customers. So if we can get, uh, you know, our ecosystem to commit to, you know, let's say a third of the capacity, you know, we feel confident that 
you know, with our outreach and our marketing and our partnerships, we can, you know, try to fill the rest with, with a hundred percent outreach, but to get to a market, it's fulfillment first and then outreach second. Uh, if I could just jump in, Jason, um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that we see the problem, um, not, not really differently, but we see a different part of that uh, problem. Um, and I would um, sum up what you were saying as one of the key problems for folks who are um, attempting to build uh, net new infrastructure, even at small scale, um, uh, like an edge micro, is that um, it's, it's finding someone who wants that um, minimum success first build that's the hardest part because um, the vast majority of buyers that um, that I've spoken to over the last five years, even before um, starting a company, um, seem to be mostly looking at small incremental initial deployments in many locations, one to 10 servers as an example. Uh, and so it's really hard without existing infrastructure as in you know, data center location, networking, et cetera, it's really hard to justify a build for someone, even if they want a thousand servers, if they want a thousand servers in a hundred locations. No, and, and I, I agree. And also what we're saying is, you know, we go, we, we pick a market, right? And we, we start selling into that market before we deploy. Just like, let me give you another one, like Lec or, um, uh, Valdosta, Georgia, that's our next location. So, you know, 60, 90 days ahead, we start calling into that market. But what's interesting, and just like the brick and mortars, we've all built them and, and ran and managed them. The customer wants to see it. The customer wants to, to know where their gear is going. So, hey, can you drive to Statesboro, which is two hours away to go walk through that one? So traditional, I mean, typically it's, it's how do you manage this process? Because a lot of them want to see it. They want to know the networks that are in. They want to ping test it. They want to see where it goes back. So it's, it's the chicken and the egg, man. So to get in this business, you've got to, you've got to put it out there and, you know, you got to put them on the ground. And I, I know Jason's doing the same thing. You know, a lot of us on the call are doing the same thing. And that's, that's the challenge, right? The challenge is telling your board, Hey, look, we want to go in these markets. They, they sound great. We've got interest, but you know, no one really is going to sign for that, you know, Ferrari without test driving it. Without yeah, it's amazing. It. It's amazing how few customers will say, no, trust me, we'll be ready when your deployment is ready. And it'll match what you want. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right, right. I mean, yeah. it, what was great about like, uh, well, the only engagement can really talk about for since it's public, but you know, they're in 200 markets already, 250. So it's co-location to them. It's a, it's a commodity. Uh, so for them to kind of, and is like you had said, it's a, it's a small deployment. It's not something that you would go and build a facility for. Uh, but they understand, right? And these were, you know, the, the way that they did do their deployments with. You know, being able to, you know, run their entire, you know, platform on, you know, seven to 10 servers is amazing, but it's, it's commodity. It's, it's a budget. They have to, it's like connectivity for them. You know, it's space power and connectivity and they already had their connectivity kind of defined. So that was an easy one. I wish they were all like that. Uh, and, and, and I think, I think in the, the early adopters that we've probably seen and, and talked to uh, some, the same, some different, you know, they understand the infrastructure comes first. And, you know, when the carriers, you know, we're, we're getting a lot more feedback from the carriers, but, uh, you know, being able to to pop here and, and localize traffic in certain markets, it, it, it's a task and, and it, it's coming. But infrastructure is going to come first. And that's, you know, the, the, the early adopters have realized that. And we've been lucky enough to, to have a few of those on board with us to kind of drive our our builds. Yeah, and I want to check in with Laura. I realize we're getting low on time. I have a few other things I'd love to cover if we can go over, but it's your, your call if we give, give a concluding question or keep going. I think we need to wrap up, unfortunately, Fader, but we've got more to come, and we're going to tell our folks how they can keep the conversation going. So uh, if you'd like to wrap up now, and we'll move it over to the networking lounge, but uh, I'll let you wrap up. Yeah, and we, we, we have zero minutes, but if everyone can jump in, I w w I'd ask everyone to give a quick snippet on – what you saw in the in the edge mark edge market that you didn't anticipate, and what you your one uh, you know unconventional forecast is for the future. Um, I'll go first um, from the edge connect side. What we're seeing is sustainability. Um, you're going to see a lot of that, um, and we're seeing just the beginning of it. 
um, you know, the has data centers are built all over the world. They have a demand for resources, natural resources, water and power. Um, so we're going to see, um, we're trying to get, we are doing our job trying to get ahead to become, you know, zero carbon footprint. Um, so, but that is, we are seeing that to become more of a topic uh, in the data center world. Yeah, oh, we're, we're seeing the same thing, Christina. Um, and uh, just to reiterate the um, uh, carbon neutral message is that um, many of the customers or potential customers that we've spoken to have made it very clear that it's not a maybe. It's if, if you're not, I'm not on a path to get to zero carbon, they just won't do business with you. It's that simple. Um, if I had to pick a, another prognostication, uh, which is um, maybe uh, a little bit more uh, forward looking with less evidence, um, is that as more and more companies globalize uh, and they go through their business transformation and or look to um, adopt edge strategies, they'll be struggling with the things that companies like Lyft and um, PayPal and eBay and uh, Uber, et cetera, have struggled with over the years. And those companies raised hundreds of millions of dollars to literally build global teams so that they could have a group of people in France that worried about communications and a group of people in in, in Sweden that worried about data um, sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera. So they could do business everywhere and they could do it safely. Um, how we as an industry potentially help facilitate that, uh, I think could be a big difference between, um, you know, people adopting sooner rather than later because the vast majority of companies don't have a hundred million dollars to set aside to build global capabilities around local traffic regulations uh, or network regulations uh, and other services like that, even even paying taxes in local currency, right? So these are all areas of opportunity, I think, for partnering and for providing a more comprehensive service to lower the barrier to entry for people to get into the edge market. I think for, for us, again, we're one side, but it's the insatiable need for connectivity. The amount of new fiber or new, new connectivity coming in and the amount of connectivity gets used up and then has to be refreshed, but it's, I don't know that it matters where you're at, but I think everybody sees a lot of need for bandwidth and connectivity. There's, there's a lot of data and that's what's driving a lot of growth for us is just new infrastructure to bring in more fiber, new pathways to get more things in our existing building, uh, 50 some carriers in the building and and growing in, in Omaha, Nebraska. So Omaha is not Chicago, it's not, it's Omaha. And there's 50 some carriers, why is that? It's because of the edge. That's what drives it. Mm -hmm. I think I'll chime in here. Um, we look at it as I hate the expression, but it, it's been overused. But you know, it's, it's going to take a village. We're all going to have to work together. Um, and uh, one of the main reasons is for the kind of unconventional prognostication is you're going to start seeing that the local market will influence the macro market. Um, up to now, it's been going from the larger tier ones into the the kind of the urban to suburban kind of mentality. Uh, but you're starting to see from gaming in, uh, industry, uh, from obviously uh, the phenomena of the YouTubers and things, you're finding a, an outside is starting to come into the inside and, and drive things uh, just from an entrance standpoint, from a social standpoint. Um, and that infrastructure that's out at that local market needs to be connected to and emulate that which is in the core. Yeah, and just, uh, I'll, I'm gonna be real quick because we're short on time, but what's fascinating to me now that I'm out of the market, you know, we all carry a bag every day. So, and we're seeing this firsthand is just the amount of data that people are interested in collecting now and, and what they're doing with it is amazing. Just like I was talking about that grocery retailer. It's just, who would have thought walking down, a you know, the Kellogg's aisle, you pull that Kellogg's cereal, put it in your cart, you come back three weeks later and you get a coupon that pops up on your phone when you walk down and says, how did you like those Cheerios? Here's $2 off. That kind of stuff is fascinating. And that's what we're seeing. You know, even a, a bottling, the, the Coca-Cola bottling plant that's outside of Atlanta, the same thing's going on there. I mean, it's just, there's so much data that they're capturing now. It's just, you would never thought five, 10 years ago that you would need that data to use it. So it's just amazing. Uh, totally agree. Uh, the carbon footprint piece for us as well, but the you know that's why I don't get mad when I'm on a social media site and all of a sudden something pops up and it's trying to sell me something. 
I'm like, that could be a good customer. You know, anybody that's trying to learn more about their buyer and like you said about Kellogg's or whoever it is, you know, they, they want so much data on their audience and it's smart. I mean, they need to understand my buying patterns and who I am. And that's great. That's going to drive more commerce and revenue. It's going to drive the industry, but it's also going to drive more compute, more workloads, more deployments, which everybody on this phone wants. Uh, so have at it, you know, keep monitoring me. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's 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 an interesting time that we're in right now. Yeah. Over. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Fedor, our guest moderator, Fedor Smith, president and managing partner of Atlantic ACM, keeping us on point. So great today. Thank you so much for that, and thank you to our insightful speakers. A great conversation. And we're not done quite yet. Just a reminder that our speakers are staying on for the remainder of the lunch hour to answer any more of your questions. All you have to do is meet them back in the networking lounge and then go ahead and table hop and talk to as many as you can. And viewers, if you were one of our first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Make sure you visit us at jsa.net to register for more upcoming JSA virtual roundtables. Our next one, mark your calendars, it's August 29th when leaders in our industry will talk about the COVID-19 effect, lessons learned around the world for critical network infrastructure. Well, that is a wrap. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, see you back in the networking lounge. Happy networking.